Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to this amazing conversation. Um, Lonnie, I think there's... Could we, could we have you meet yourself? Okay. So, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with you. You amazing leader in healthcare in Africa. Um, I feel very honored to be able to moderate what I'm sure is going to be an amazing conversation. Uh, my name is Demi Guatsuboso. I run um, um, I run a company called LifeBank uh, in Nigeria, uh, looking to transform the health system of actually not in Nigeria. As of uh, two weeks ago, we actually launched in Kenya. So we are now in Nigeria and Kenya, uh, uh, helping to transform the supply chain for healthcare in this part of the world. Um, so I, I'm sure that everybody on the channel uh, and on this conversation have you know, some understanding of health system. So I'm not gonna you know, bore you guys on you know, going on a big spiel about what a health system is. Uh, but I think it's really powerful. And I think one of the things that COVID-19 has shown is why it's so critical to do some, to, to you know, build better health systems for Africa and to make sure that we build resiliency and flexibility and growth and, and strength uh, for our health system so that we can deal with uh, pandemics uh, as they come. So as of today, there are about 1.48 one million uh, um, COVID-19 cases in Africa. And uh, we know that 30, we've lost, sadly, 36,144 uh, people uh, of African in Africa. And uh, we have about 220,000 active cases uh, across Africa. So all of this has shown in, you know, a couple of years back, uh, you know, uh, Southern, you know, uh, Western Africa, if you will, dealt with an Ebola crisis. And of course, we've had multiple Ebola crises across uh, East and, and Central Africa in the last couple of years. Uh, so pandemic have become, you know, part of our world. And, you know, it is really critical for Africa because we don't, we don't know. Uh, we've been able to have a relatively mild case uh, um, version of COVID-19, but we're not sure what's going to happen. We're not sure how the next COVID, you know, in this pandemic age will affect us. So we're incredibly glad uh, to have this conversation. So in my company, LifeBank, we did a lot of work to help uh, Nigeria respond and Kenya respond to COVID-19. Um, and we, you know, as soon as COVID-19 hit, we went through, you know, it's a lot of iterative process to help the country respond and, and Kenya, of course, to help both countries respond to COVID-19. We did a lot of work around testing. We opened the first testing center in Nigeria, rapidly partnering with public institutions and private businesses to help you know, create a COVID-19 testing center. Uh, we actually were able to build three, uh, and we've been able to test over you know, 20, almost 20,000 people for COVID-19, the highest uh, private sector uh, testing partner in Nigeria. Um, and we're not a testing company, you know, we had to respond and we had to build some resiliency into our models so that we can help the country respond to medical emergencies. Um, we did some work around treatment. We delivered critical medical oxygen to the last mile to about nine states in Nigeria. Again, helping to ensure that this, this critical supply is available to uh, patients uh, that have COVID-19. And we'll continue to do the work. Um, so I'm incredibly, not enough about me and enough about life. I'm incredibly honored to have this amazing panel. Uh, thank you so much, guys, for joining me, Lonnie, uh, Wawira, and Isabel. Thank you for joining this conversation. We're incredibly honored to have you. So to start with, I will have you guys introduce yourself first. Tell me, uh, tell the, the audience a little bit about yourself, about your company, and what you're open, what change you're open to bring uh, to Africa's health system. Lonnie, do you want to start? I'd be happy to. Thank, thank you, Tim. Um, so my name is Lonnie Hackett. I'm president and co-founder of Healthy Learners. 
and we're working with the Zambian government to uh, harness technology to empower teachers as community healthcare workers and to integrate health into the education system. And so uh, we've been working with the Zambian government now for a little over five years. Uh, currently, we serve all the public primary uh, schools in Lusaka district, uh, serving just over 250,000 kids. And we're working right now with the government to, to scale that nationally. Um, and uh, look forward to sharing a little bit more about our work and as particularly as it relates to COVID-19 over the course of this webinar. Thank you, Lonnie. Um, what we are? I was on mute. <laughs> I almost started speaking about unmuting myself. But uh, my name is Wawira. I am the founder of Food for Education. And uh, we provide low cost meals, nutritious meals to kids in public primary schools. Our work is primarily in Kenya. We've been providing these lunches to kids since 2012 and have since provided 5 million meals. And um, during COVID-19, COVID provided uh, 2 million meals to kids and their families, especially as schools were closed in Kenya. So I'm excited to be on this panel, especially because I'm a nutritionist. So I view health as a broad spectrum, not just medical care in a hospital. So I'm very excited to be speaking about health from as it relates to an entire life cycle. So thank you for having me. Yes, hi, thank you, Temi. Um, I'm Isabel Kamariza, and I'm from Rwanda. Um, I run an NGO called Solid Africa. And what we do in Solid Africa is that we help vulnerable patients in public hospitals here in Kigali, uh, mainly by giving them part of their medical care, our biggest one being food. So we deliver food to 800 patients every day with three meals a day. And we provide clean drinking water, we provide hygienic products. So we give a holistic approach to the issue the patient can face when they're in public hospital. And um, so I'm a big advocate of um, healthcare systems that are centered to the patient and a holistically approach to the issue that they can face while they're in hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, for that lovely introduction. I was saying earlier, I just find, you know, all the work that you guys are doing incredibly interesting. And um, it's not, uh, for the most part, core healthcare, but it is so critical to how we actually deliver healthcare uh, for, the, for, for the people of Africa. You know, everything that you are doing is about your work, you know, with food and young people in Kigali, uh, where we are, your work, you know, around, around what you're doing. And Lonnie, I just feel like there's so much, you know, there's so much uh, that, Health is so much more than uh, hospital care. Healthcare is so many things and so many different things. So I am just incredible, incredibly excited to have this conversation. Um, what does it mean to build a resilient health system? You know, um, resilient health system, uh, every actor, um, all the people that are in this health system working together in concert to build beautiful purpose um, systems that would allow us to actually deliver care for our people. Um, we believe deeply that local teams, you know, local teams fully, you know, localized in these communities, that it is the community itself that understands its problem well. And that when we have local teams, local innovators, particularly young people, uh, willing to do the work, that we have resiliency, we build systems in place that would help us respond to medical emergencies or even just help us respond to things like you know, malnutrition around uh, specifically for children. Uh, we think I think that health systems need to be flexible. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, you know, this, you know, this COVID times and this pandemic times, we need flexibility in the way we are structuring our businesses and the way we are structuring innovation. Health systems should be value focused. And we want to be patient focused. We want to focus on the people, you know, to make sure that we're delivering services to them in the way that they most want and in the way that drives impact in their lives. So the first question I want to ask is it is I've already spoken briefly about what it means for me to be to build a resilient health system. But I want to know what it means for you guys. Um, what do you think? When you think about resilient health system, what's going on in your head? How does that fit the work you're doing in your organization? Let's go ahead. Perhaps we can start with what we're at this time. 
Okay. Um, I was actually just writing down some of the things that I find very personal in terms of health system. So a bit of background is that my, both my parents were healthcare workers. And so I grew up with a big sense of, you know, having the ability to get medicine, for example, when you're sick because your mom knows and is able to treat you. She ran a clinic as well. But I think that growing up, one of the things is that my view of health has expanded more than just medicine when you're sick to, uh, you know, nutrition, how, what kind of nutrition are you getting to prevent you from getting sick or to enable your body to have the immunity, to have the ability to, for children specifically to grow properly, to have the right, um, to have the right ability to be able to contribute to the economy as well. So I think that one of the things that I think about in terms of health is dignity. How can, health is about having a life of dignity, I think, because having a life of dignity also impacts your mental health, it, it impacts your physical health. And so in terms of how I think about health, it's very locally based, very dignity driven and encompassing, not just when someone is sick, but from birth to death. How does someone live a life of dignity? How do they live a life where they feel rooted, where their mental health is taken care of, whether they, where they have the right nutrition, and where in case they fall sick, they have access to the right medical care. I, I just, I feel like I'm just nodding really hard because I, I completely, you know, agree with the idea of dignity. I think dignity is really important as we and focus um, and building systems for our patients and specifically for the people and making sure that and healthcare is not just about hospital care like like you said you know healthcare also has you know, mental well-being people human dignity and also hospital care when should it be needed uh, so that's really incredibly powerful isabel uh, what do you believe um, when you hear building resilient health systems what are you thinking um I agree a lot with Warira, and also what I'm thinking when I, I hear about resilient system is really a healthcare system that can adapt. And you're talking about the pandemic and how the world was so surprised how Africa could have less cases than in Europe with um, less infrastructure when it comes to the healthcare. But I think it's the ad adaptability part is how do you build systems, but how do you adapt systems to different um, issues to different situations that really arise. And of course, as I was saying, to build systems that are centered to the patient, because for so long, and even until now, they are really centered uh, on the medical side, on, on the medicine side, side, uh, side, on the infrastructure. But what about the person behind? Because the one that we want to, to heal, the one that we want to save, uh, if they are not taken care completely, then we are doing the job halfway. And she was talking about nutrition, but there's so much more in mental illness and hygiene. When you see somebody that is sick in the hospital and they can spend two or three days without taking a shower, it's unbelievable that we can have a system where all those issues are not integrated and included. And I think the more we build the system around the patient, the more resilient we'll be, and then the more we can adapt when things happen. Um, because I think the pandemic was a big challenge for many countries, but I also see it as really a chance for us to improve, a chance for us to build uh, a more sustainable healthcare system, and a chance for us to be to say like, okay, we are ready for the next one, but hopefully there won't be any next one, but we are ready to tackle it in really in a better way, uh, without the same stress that we went through uh during this pandemic you no know, i i agree completely about making sure that we're patient focused we're adaptable um and i completely agree that one of the ways that africa was able to respond to covid 19 in a way that you know reduced our case was because we already had the infrastructure to re respond to these diseases you know we were also adaptable our system responded quicker uh, so i think that is you know we need to hold on to that and continue telling that story lonnie uh, what what is when you hear again when you hear resilient health system what are you thinking yeah well you know i couldn't agree more with yourself both Luir and isabel as well you know, how do you build a healthcare system that is nimble 
adaptable, that is responsive to the needs of the patient, that really promotes dignity and is, is equitable as well. Um, and I, I think COVID-19 has just emphasized how important resilient healthcare systems are. Um, and for us, the work we're doing here in Zambia, I think that's reflective of, of uh, the work of everyone here on this panel is how important it is to leverage non-traditional settings for healthcare and also to leverage non-traditional healthcare workers to be a part of the healthcare system. Uh, COVID has shown that health is related to everything, that it, you know, it impacts every single sector. For us, we work with education and across not just Zambia, but the world schools closed down. Um, and it became really critical of how can we continue to make sure that A, those kids are able to get back into school, but also that they're uh, uh, connected to the healthcare system. So I think leveraging non-traditional settings is really critical to expanding health service delivery. So it's not just reactive of people going to clinics, but it's proactively looking at providing those services to those who need it. And by leveraging community members as non-traditional healthcare workers, it also is strengthening the healthcare workforce and it's bringing together those key stakeholders in the community. Um, who, you, for us, you know, it's bringing together teachers, school administrators, community leaders, health facility members. And when you have the kind of collaboration of those key stakeholders on the ground, you're going to be more nimble. It's going to be focused on the needs of the patient because those are their neighbors, those are their community members. Um, and lastly, I think also it's not just on the community level, but looking at how can you promote that at more of a governance level as well of bringing together those different sectors. And it's critical at, at a national level for ministries of health to have strong governance, but also for other ministries, uh, whether that is finance or for our case, education, to also have strong leadership and to be able to incorporate health services into the work that they're doing. And I think one of the silver linings that could come out of COVID is health won't be just seen as a responsibility of the Ministry of Health anymore, but it's something that needs to be built into education. It needs to be built into agriculture, into commerce, because we can't be shut, every sector can't shut down as a result of emerging infectious diseases. And so I think that's also a real opportunity to promote more buy-in and, and a sense of ownership as well. Uh, Lonnie, I, I completely agree. You know, I agree about bringing healthcare into non-traditional settings and making sure that healthcare is jointly built, right? Um, I think a lot of times, you know, in when we're thinking about healthcare, we think, oh, it's for, you know, the healthcare people, it's for the hospital people, it's for the doctors and the nurses. And I think part of what you're saying is, you know, we need to bring healthcare into education, we need to bring healthcare into, you know, agriculture, uh, we need to bring healthcare into nutrition, uh, and everything is all connected because when something breaks in healthcare, it breaks everything, you know, it literally shuts down an economy, you know, it shuts down everything, and the world has finally seen, uh, you know, why it's so critical to, to start having this conversation about how healthcare can affect everything, but also everything else can make sure that healthcare is strong. Uh, speaking of, you know, non-traditional setting, I think that's all of us on this call, myself inclusive and Life Bank inclusive, are all non-traditional healthcare players, right? You know, we're not, you know, I'm not a doctor. I don't think any of you guys are. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, we are, you know, we do deliver services to hospital, but we don't work every day inside a hospital. And we still are really critical to building these resilient health systems. So what do you think about that? Like, you know, how do you, you know, I think the question is, how do you actually, with your work, influence changes in the health system as a non-traditional healthcare player. Isabel, perhaps we can start with you this time. Yes, um, great question. And um, I think that maybe it take non-clinician people also to analyze system in another way. Um, like for us, giving food to, to patients at the hospital has been a status quo in many African countries where Hospital relies on family and friends to come and deliver food, food for you. So it's a burden they don't want to take on. Um, and it has been like that for years. And not only in Rwanda, in many African countries. So now to come and say, we want to change the system. We want to give food security to patients. We want to take off that burden from the family, especially when the family is far. We want to take in the burden from the, 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 the caregiver that accompanies his uh, patient to be able really to think about how can I take care of my patient without thinking about food. And imagining being sick and wondering where's my meal coming from. Um, so for us really, you need that other aspect. Uh, maybe if I was a doctor and a clinician, I would be thinking about 
medicine, how to heal, more trainings, more equipment, more whatever to be able to serve the patient. But as a non-clinician, I'm thinking about the patient, like what do they need? Maybe they need just morale, they need just that soap, they need that, that food. But what we, want to, what we want to do is really, now that we've done that, how can we put that in the system? How can the, the system now accept it um, as something that will always stay? How can we now integrate it in the healthcare system? And that really needs for us to assess well the healthcare system, to know who are the players in that healthcare system, and to know how to influence um, the mindset. Because it's easy when things are like they were always been, and change is really difficult sometimes, and require a lot of fundings, require a lot of understanding and mindset changing. So I think our work is really how to influence all of that and how to make sure that the people that we serve stay at the center of what we do. And um, I always tell myself, and when I feel discouraged or I feel like I, I'm not longer in touch with what I'm doing, I'm always telling myself I have to go back to my first love, which is being I go back to the hospital, I talk to the patient, and again, I remember all the challenges that they are facing and how can we do that to really respond to their needs. And not only from an outside point of view, but because we are in that community and that's how and that's why as locally led NGO in the community we know that whatever happens we will stay in the community so we won't leave the community we won't say you know i don't see it anymore it would still be in front of us so i think it's really to know the different um, aspects of the healthcare systems uh, systems and to know how to play with it and to influence it and um, yeah, it might take a lot of years. I've been doing that for 10 years and I'm still long, far from what I, we want to achieve as an organization. But I'm really hopeful that once you show that something is working, then people want to adopt it. And um, as inconceivable as it can sound, that sometimes you have to show data and prove that, oh, you know, feeding a patient with three meals a day that are tailored to the illness with a specific diet and taking care of the nutrition is part of the, medic, the, the medical uh, healing process and the medical care. Uh, proving that might sound like crazy, like everybody knows if you're sick, you need to eat, but sometimes you have to put data and prove it. This is how it goes for the systems to change. Thank you. Absolutely. I think that's powerful. The idea of telling stories, going back to the patients, uh, you know, leaning, you know, leaning into their story to inspire yourself and also making sure that we're actually using data to prove uh, these kind of innovations are critical uh, to, to, to outcomes, to health outcomes for our people. Uh, well, we are, you know, what would you, how would you respond to that question? You know, as a non-traditional healthcare uh, person, how do you make sure that you're influencing healthcare decisions um, in, you know, healthcare settings to, to ensure better outcomes for people? Um, yeah, I think I agree with Isabel in terms of, I mean, I had down the use of data to show outcomes that matter specifically to healthcare uh, decision makers. So for example, you know, clinics and doctors and Ministry of Health and those kind of actors. So what we do, we're working in school settings where, you know, it's a non-traditional health center because as, you know, Lonnie works in schools as well, schools is where kids are aggregating, where they're like, likely to fall sick, where if they don't get the right meal, they'll miss out on a lot of the nutrition they're supposed to get because they're in school for a chunk of the day. And what we do is we look at, for example, the kind of meals that we provide, uh, make sure that it's very highly nutritious. So our meals provide over 50% of the recommended daily allowance for a child. So in that one meal, they're getting over half of what they're supposed to be getting in an entire day. And we use data to show, for example, impact on education as well and nutrition. So whether it's heights, it's weights. I remember when COVID-19, right in the, around June, July, we started doing, um, we, we measured these kids that we had started feeding during the pandemic that were not part of our program before. We started measuring heights and weights and finding out are there kids who are malnourished? Are there kids who are close to being underweight? And we found that a lot of them were. 
that they were very on the brink of being underweight and being undernourished. And so an intervention that provides school meals also, although looking like an outside of health uh, intervention is actually addressing the, the need itself in terms of malnutrition, in terms of diseases, and also using our intervention to bring in other health interventions. For example, we have the warming services we do sometimes with the Ministry of Health partnerships with kids and making sure that this one thing that you're providing can be bundled up with other things that provide bigger outcomes and enable kids to thrive. And I think the other thing for me is around expanding the definition of health as we've been talking on this panel, where we expand the definition of health to a child went to a clinic because they were sick, to what made them go to a clinic, what kind of classroom are they learning in, what have they been eating, what kind of water are they drinking, and all these other things that encompass health that a lot of times we only consider after a child has appeared at a clinic sick. So how do we expand the definition? How do we get more actors to see the opportunities that are there in non-hospital settings to create healthy environments for, in our case, children to thrive. I really like the opportunity that has come with COVID-19 for us to expand that definition and the, 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 the perspective now that health isn't a hospital issue. You know, it can affect the private sector, it can affect the transport sy systems, it can affect the education systems, it can affect so many other, all the other aspects of our economies. And that means that all of everything we do as being alive is a health issue and we should be doing everything to improve the dignity and the quality of life for each and every other human being. Interesting. So just to follow up on that, um, do you think that there is more openness and willingness to listen to, you know, your voice uh, and your organization's voice? In, you know sectors uh in in, in more like uh in, in in public sectors to listen to your voice and your your opinion about how to build dignity and how to sort of like restructure a health system uh and from the time before covid and now after covid mm -hmm. or during covid uh you know do you feel like you know people are more willing to listen to your voice yeah, definitely. I think I'll give us an example of this is about hand washing centers in schools. Before COVID-19, you know, hand washing centers were necessary. It was on paper that schools should have hand washing centers and we were pushing for that. But now COVID-19 highlighted how, you know, everyone is like, wash your hands for 20 seconds. And so each and every school has to have hand washing centers, which was something that we, you know, we kept saying that hand washing centers are important, that children should have hand washing centers. We tried to provide to the schools that we serve with. And now the government is instituting that for every 50 children, there should be one hand washing center. So thinking about something like that as something that, you know, we've tried to advocate for before and now is actually being taken ser seriously because, you know, hand washing is the most important thing to prevent yourself from getting COVID-19 and hygiene. And then the other thing we've seen is, um, so our model involves central production and distribution of food. So our food is usually very high quality of uh, standards of production and distribution. And so before COVID-19, that was a nice to have. It wasn't completely necessary that food production has to be done in a certain way so that there's no cross-contamination. So we kept the same standards. And for us, it's not such a big shift going into food production when schools reopen because those are the same standards that we've been having. But for a lot of um, other schools, the struggle is going to be how do you make sure the temperature is safe? How do you make sure that food is produced and provided in a safe sanitary way, which wasn't something that was being so, it was, it was important, but it wasn't as important as it is right now. So I think COVID-19 has brought us this opportunities to be able to say, let's wash our hands, let's eat good food, you know, let's take care of our bodies. And even the, you know, in Kenya, we've had a big drive around nutrition being a way to prevent from getting COVID-19. So getting the right kind of vegetables and fruits and things like that to be, uh, to build up your immunity. So now that it's become more important to eat nutritious food because it helps you not get this virus. So I think that th those are some of the things that have really shifted, which to me are, and to a lot of people it may seem obvious, but COVID-19 has made it absolutely necessary for you to wash your hands and eat the right food.
amazing. I, I thought, um, it's fantastic. Hi, Lonnie. Um, you know, you are the, you know, you are really centered in terms of, you know, pulling different parts of uh, a public sector to, you know, doing things that help healthcare. Uh, in your opinion, what do you think matters in making sure that your voice and your, um, the way you do things and your own, um, you know, uh, reason data, if you will, uh, is being listened to in these kind of sectors and pulling people together? No, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I think aware of both really touched on some critical points. And I, clearly, clinicians, nurses, lab technicians are all absolutely critical components to a healthcare system. But there are so many components uh, that go into, into health. Uh, and there are so many different social determinants to health, whether that's prevention, nutrition, or the actual service delivery. And so I think for me, when, you know, as a, as a non-clinician, um, someone who spends more time in public health, when people ask the question, if I'm not a doctor, how can I really have an impact? Um, you know, I always say, start with looking for what, where the problems are. You know, where are those social problems where social innovations, not just medical innovations, are really key to improve health outcomes? For us, it was seeing that in Lusaka, primary health care is generally available and it's free. Uh, and so in theory, you would expect that the population would have ready access to that care, to seeing doctors and clinicians, nurses. Um, but in reality, there are segments of the population that don't utilize it. Um, so the equity of those services, even though cost isn't one of the barriers, there are other hidden barriers that impact that. And for us, what we realized in Zambia is that school-aged children, not, not just in Zambia, but globally, tend to have the fewest touch points with the healthcare system. And so it wasn't a medical solution that was required to address. A lot of the health issues are, are fairly straightforward to deal with, um, but it was how do we connect those services to the kids who really need it the most? Um, and that required thinking outside of the box. So it was how can we move that access point from clinics to where these kids already are? As we were mentioned about in Zambia, 90% of kids are enrolled in school. So that's a great aggregation point for not just education, but also health and nutrition services. Who spends those time with the kids? Teachers. You know, they're already uh, spending more time than perhaps anyone else in their lives. And so there's a, a great uh, already existing professional population that can also be leveraged for the delivery of health services. And so I think, you know, non-traditional health workers, you know, non-clinicians bring in a fresh perspective as well that can help find those gaps. Because oftentimes the gap may not be in the clinic itself. It may be how do we get more people to access care at the health facility? How can we make sure that they get sick less often by improving their nutrition? Um, and so I think for us, as far as how do we make sure our voice is heard, um, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time on, on all levels in, in the community level, talking to the health facilities, talking to the schools, talking to the community members at the district level, because that's where a lot of the programs are implemented. Also, just uh, convene, uh, having multiple convenings to, to make sure not just our voices, but the voices of the community are being considered as well. And then on the national level, making sure when, they, when planning is happening, policy development, um, making sure that they're taking more of a holistic approach. Um, and for us, seconding what we were saying of COVID has provided an opportunity where, you know, there's more buy-in to, to bring in different sectors. Um, you know, we, we found ourselves in a unique position where uh, schools opened in Zambia on the 1st of June. Um, and on May, I believe it was 14th, uh, the president made an announcement uh, that in two weeks, uh, schools would open across the country for those examination grades. Um, and that was that same time that the Ministry of Education really became aware of that. Um, and so a lot of work had to be done. And, you know, for us, it was fortunate that the next morning, uh, the director at the Ministry of Education called us to ask if we could help develop the guidelines to do that. Um, and I think the reason was, is that, you know, we we're in the center, we could bring together the Ministry of Health, we could bring together the Ministry of Education to, you know, be that broker to, to so that the lessons from the Ministry of Health were, so that to, to come to that agreement um, and really to make sure that both parties were involved and for us, we always try to leverage that position to make sure the, the voices on the ground are heard too, to bring in the head teachers, to bring in the clinic staff. So it's not just high level policy, but it also is practical. So we're, we're sure that we're not just developing great documents, but what we're developing can be implemented as well. Um, so I think for us, the fact that we've placed an effort in building relationships across different ministries is now, particularly with COVID, seen as a real value add, where different ministries uh, are actually coming to us because they're seeing that we can help, you know, foster the relationships between, say, the Ministry of Health and Education as well.
And I think what I'm hearing is from you is co-creation and you guys being at the center, everybody, to, everybody together to drive change. That is incredibly powerful. Um, and, and I just, I feel like, you know, COVID-19 was such a black, black swan event for most people in the world. But I think that it also, it also has some positive things uh, to offer, particularly in the health system. I think there's more openness, like, you know, where we are and Lonnie and Isabel mentioned, you know, there's more openness to listen to incredible leaders like you guys, uh, punching above your weight and, and doing the work and really, really drilling down and, and making sure that things happen for, for our people and, and your driving impact. I'm incredibly honored uh, to be one of you guys. Um, so you guys are young, you're innovative, you're doing this great work. What are the sort of like technology you're using? You know, what are the innovations uh, you've seen in your sector, either food innovation or, you know, even hospital care innovation or even like just like policy and, and, and sort of like, you know, co-creation innovation. What are you using? Uh, tell our audience what you're using and what you're seeing other people use within your sector. Anyone can start, you know, Lonnie, Wawira, Isabel, you can all decide to start. Yeah. Let me go first. Tell me, thank you for your question. Um, I think there's a lot of things happening um, in the healthcare when it comes to innovation. But one thing that really struck with me was last year we started a yoga program. So I've heard about yoga for patients, yoga for caregivers. And, I wasn't really before that a yoga person and um and we started last year um doing yoga for 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 parents especially who have kids with cancer at the hospital in the pediatric unit and it was just amazing how the breathing exercise helped and when we came back like because we're doing it every week and after three months we did a session of helping you or this is just us coming with an idea and you don't really like it. And then I remember having that father saying like, my daughter has a heart, a heart um, disease. And when we are back to, to, to our home in the village, sometimes she has crisis. And normally I'm like panicking. I don't know what to do, who to call, what to do. And then I remembered about the breathing exercise. So I was doing the breathing and that made me calm down thinking and then my daughter could see that oh, I'm not that stressed because she would be stressed to see me stressed. So seeing that just yoga, how it can impact it. And we've been doing that in the most, in the biggest public hospitals. And now we have demand from doctors, from nurses, because them too, they have a lot of pressure, anxious, uh, anxiety um, that they face. And I think that's one of the things that Solid Africa wants really to push um and maybe in the future do study and see how does it really help the patient um have a better morale a less stressful uh stay at the hospital but also when they are back home because especially people that are living with chronic diseases we teach them like how to eat how to do but we never thought about how do you take care of your spirituality how do you take care of your inner self uh so that you are really in the best morale when you when you are dealing with your illness. And um, yeah, and study have showed that when you have great morale, you heal better. So I think um, yoga is a great avenue. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to share that because I've heard about it, but I never paid attention uh, before we, we started. And we did that in a partnership with an organization called Azar Foundation. And that's really their mission is that they train people in yoga and they try then to teach them to vulnerable communities, not only in hospital, but in schools, uh, homes, uh, whatever. Thank you. Amazing, Isabel. You know, yoga is millions of years old, but you're able to take it and use it in this new way to serve your community. That's innovation. I love it. Um, you know, I think speaking i was thinking you know we have a life bank we have about you know 60 you know medical dispatch riders and their work is to deliver you know blood and oxygen round the clock you know in the middle of the night uh to hospitals across you know this continent like nigeria across nigeria and then also in kenya and i was thinking to myself yoga 
you know it's a very stressful work and you know they gotta like be there you gotta deliver this order you know that there's a life you know in the balance and it's quite stressful for them so i'm gonna like you know i'm gonna check it out you know i'm gonna get them to start doing yoga that, that's gonna be really hilarious to watch <laughs> but um i'm gonna try it out uh, uh well, what about you um, so for us, in terms of innovation opportunities, I think um, during this time of COVID-19, one of the things that has been more we've had to innovate around is, um, you know, distribution, because distribution usually happens in schools for us, and schools close, so we didn't have them as distribution centers anymore. And also, we had to think about um, how do we build new distribution centers and how do we use the technology that we parents contribute through? It's called Tap to Eat. So it's a wristband that kids wear to school. It's an NFC wristband. They top it. Uh, they top up 15 cents per meal using mobile money. So we, as a technology that we've used for parents to access us, we thought about how do we use this technology to access kids to access their families as well. So we change the, maybe the route of, of information is coming to us versus how do we get to them? How do we give them information about these are the new distribution centers? This is how you're gonna come in at this time because also because of social distancing regulations, we couldn't have every single person that we give food to, which is around 10,000 kids every day then to come and collect food and come and collect food packages as we've been distributing during COVID-19. So we had to create first new distribution centers, and then we had to organize distribution based on, uh, first of all, we had to call all the parents, find out where they live, find out how COVID-19 was impacting them as we designed our COVID response, uh, find out one of the key data, uh, data sets that we got was around, around loss of income. So find out how much did you used to earn before COVID-19, how much do you earn right now? To be able to design something in terms of, if we're giving out food packages, this is a quantities, this is a quality, this is the kind of food that we should be distributing so that families are actually able to get value from it. And so we call the parents, we mapped their location. So we also were finding out where do they live geographically? Because initially we only knew school children by where they went to school. And now we had to know school children by where they live which kind of area they live in and how can we map them to distribution centers. So that enabled us to be able to distribute our COVID-19 response food that served over 2 million meals. But it was really a lot of nitty gritty going down from, you know, schools being, you know, you get a thousand, two thousand children in one school to actually thinking, where does this child live next to this child? And sometimes they don't, they're not even from the same school, but they're all in our system. So mapping them and being able to distribute to them was something that we used a lot of technology and looked at it from, I think, a very, I mean, it seems nice and grand right now, but it was very nitty gritty and very much trying to learn as we go along because it was something we've never done before. Our distribution was primarily through schools. We'd never distribution distributed anywhere else. And also we'd never distributed um, dry food versus hot food. So also learning how that logistically should be done. So that's how we innovated during this time. What we've seen also during this uh, COVID-19 in terms of food distribution is trying to create guidelines around especially social distancing during food distribution. Because in a lot of our countries, when food is being distributed, there's usually crowds and crowds. You know, people are rioting, people want, get, want to get food. There was a time in Kenya during this COVID-19 period where there was a stampede and two people died trying to get food. So we had to make sure that our distribution centers did not have the same type of chaos, that they were able, people were able to get in, have a clear flow of people. It wasn't a hot zone to get COVID-19 and people were able, able to get the food packages and go home and prepare that for their kids and their families. Uh, I
you're speaking, you know, I'm a mom and, and you know, I, 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 I have to do a lot of lunch during COVID-19 that I wouldn't have had to do, but I feel like, you know, we need your service uh, across the world to get those nutritious food uh, in a very busy time of, 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 the, of, of the year. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. It's an incredible story. And of course, like mapping those kids, I think, you know, it's going to even make your work, you know, easier post-COVID to make sure that you are not learning so much more about these kids. You're learning what, what their situations are. Um, and, and I think it's just beautiful. And it's a, I think it's going to be a richer experience for the, for the kids as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Lonnie, you know, how are you using technology to co-create uh, with all these major uh, uh, you know, how are the, How are you using innovation to bring them together? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, Tammy. And I just, you know, to me, I think it's exceptionally exciting to see the potential for technology to both improve quality, but also facilitate impact at scale. So for us, uh, we work with our tech partner, ThinkMD, uh, to develop a uh, application for our teachers to screen children. Uh, so basically, it, allow, it allows our teachers to do integrated clinical assessments, just like a physician would do. So it runs them through a series of questions uh, and then based on the algorithm it has inside, it's able to provide them with a preliminary diagnosis as well as support their decision making on what sort of treatment should be provided in the school, as well as uh, whether that child requires a referral to the health facility. Um, and so we've been able to migrate all of our uh, teachers from paper based to tablet. So, you know, after a child is screened by a teacher, they're required to follow up within three days. So that follow up is also captured there. Health education is captured, deworming and vitamin A is captured. And not only does this improve the kind of repertoire of what our teachers can do, because it improves their ability to do assessments, but it also generates an enormous data set. And we're quickly developing one of the largest data sets on school-aged children's health, not just in Zambia, but probably more regionally. Um, and I think we're just scratching the surface of the potential of what that data can be used for. Um, so for us, that's where a lot of our current innovation is happening. Um, and we really use data for three fronts, for performance management, um, for decision making, and for community health surveillance. So for, for performance management, we partnered with uh, the RippleWorks Foundation and worked with some data scientists to, to build out algorithms. Um, so basically, it automates customized reports for schools and for teachers on how well their performance has been. And it's able to generate automated recommendations depending on how well they're doing. Um, so to, as we scale, make sure that our mentorship and technical support is scaling with us, uh, which has helped us keep costs low and actually improve the, the, the mentorship that we're providing. Um, we also are able to use the data we're collecting. We're collecting you know, all of the uh, uh, epidemiological data from every assessment. So we're able to identify disease trends and then customize the program to the needs of local schools and communities. If we see an increase in diarrheal diseases, we're really promote for schools to do lessons on hygiene and sanitation. Um, and lastly is it allows us to really support community health surveillance. Um, all of that data allows us to monitor disease trends and to detect outbreaks early. So uh, at the request of the Ministry of Health, we're now working with the CDC and the Ministry of Health to leverage the platform we've created to improve the government's community health surveillance systems. So we'll be using both the syndromic data that we're collecting, so the, the clinical assessment data, as well as building out an absenteeism tracker so that the Ministry of Health can now use that data to identify, are we seeing a spike in absenteeism that could be the result of COVID or another infectious disease? And also to be able to then compare that with what they're seeing from a health trend. Are they seeing an increase in diarrheal cases, an increase in fevers? Um, so really be able to use that to then customize and, and respond accordingly. And our schools are about, and clinics have been using that. We've had examples where there have been increases in symptoms consistent with uh, bilharzia or schistosomiasis. So the clinic, independent of us, will send lab technicians to test to see if there's an issue. We've had cases where increases in diarrhea led to the health facilities and environmental lab technicians to test water quality. So that data also, by sharing that with our partners, allows them to be more responsive as well. Um, so for us, we're incredibly excited both for the impact that technology is allowing us to do as far as scaling and managing the, uh, managing the performance of our program, but also to leverage the program that we're developing to also improve the Ministry of Health uh, capacity to just monitor more broadly community health. Um, so excited to see what happens there over the next several months and years as well. Isn't incredible, you know, 
I think data is really key, you know, particularly how, as we're sort of like responding to this uh, major pandemic. And one of the things that pandemic do is, you know, they, they stop us from speaking to each other. So we have a full sense of what's happening in our communities. And I, I think it's really incredible your work to, you know, gather all these disparate uh, data sets and use it to, you know, suggest actionable insights for the school system but also for other systems within your the communities where you're working i think it's incredibly powerful and i think it's gonna be you know a game changer in how we respond to uh, uh medical emergencies um in in africa so i think we're getting towards the end of our panel uh this incredible you know it's been a lovely conversation you know in the beginning i was like wow what are we going to talk about for an hour? But, but you know, time just flew by, and I just love. I can. I have so many other questions that I could ask, but I think we'll give you know our audience a chance to ask you guys uh, some important questions. Uh, so, guys, if you're listening to us, please, if you have any questions to uh, for Isabel, Wawira, and Lonnie, uh, please put it on the chat, and I will ask them. We have about I think eight minutes until the end of the of the uh, session, so uh, we have eight minutes to answer your questions. I think the first question that I see here is from Deborah Aloyo. Uh, she says that she totally agrees with you guys. A health system which can weather any storm will build itself around a patient. Of course, I think that's critical. Leverage non-traditional healthcare settings. Hello, you guys. Um, and workers at the same time ensure the dignity of patients. That's important. Uh, we have learned from the pandemic that a low resource setting can be created anywhere in the world. Uh, the critical question is, though, how do we leverage what we have learned to influence change in preparation for today and the future, you know, and other pandemics and other, you know, other medical emergencies? What have we learned that we can use, uh, you know, to influence change? And I think you guys have mentioned that a little bit, but what is the new thing that you're learning now that you're going to use in the future to say, okay, when something happens or whether something happens or not, this is what we're going to do to make sure that we're influencing change in the health system. So that's what we can start this time. I think that, uh, again, for me, I, I think the biggest lesson for us is to learn the expanded definition of health. So instead of limiting it to hospital care, um, I think that one of the biggest lessons I hope that we've all learned, including uh, especially for governments and for those of us who work in government settings, is that, um, you know, health doesn't, is not just about uh, hospitals. So that's one of the things that I hope this pandemic has brought. And I think that also learning from the perspective that local people know best, because, you know, when, um, when we had, when the pandemic hit, I think that a lot of times, even for, you know, let's say the Kenyan government, a certain area intervention won't work in Nairobi as it works in another part of, of Kenya. So working with communities very well to understand how do, what does health look like for you and how do we improve that and how do we help you achieve the quality of health and the quality of life and the dignity that we all aspire to in terms of healthcare. So I think that that's one of the things that I've learned should be a learning past this pandemic. You know, all different communities react differently to pandemics. You know, I was in parts of Kenya where they wouldn't wear masks, you know, versus in, in areas where they, you know, they're very, a lot of Kenya people wear masks, but in other areas they didn't believe in Corona because of different other issues of, you know, beliefs and, also more traditional outlook of life than believing in modern medicine. So that's something I think in terms of appealing to people is meeting them where they at, they're at and helping the local solutions that have already developed grow and be able to impact for the outcomes that you want. Where I think that local, you know, localization of, you know, your innovation is really critical. You know, we just launched in Kenya and um, it's all different, <laughs> you know, it's all different, you know, and it's really critical. So we are working with our local team, the local community where we're operating to make sure that we're building, you know, Life Bank Kenya in a way that is really, really for, for the local.
context. And I think, you know, we, we had to make sure that we had, you know, uh, people on the board who are from Kenya, you know, the team are all Kenyan. Um, and it's really important to understand the local reality and, and localize your innovation so that it lasts. Um, it's really, really critical. So thank you for that point. Isabel? Uh, yes, I think really what I have learned and that will be of service for, for the future, it's to control your value chain. Um, in Solid Africa, what we have is really a farm to fork approach. So we farm 80% of what we produce. So when the pandemic happened, that was really one of the things that made us give the same meals with the same quality at the same price. Um, even if we deliver the food for free, it didn't cost us more during the pandemic. So when there were scarcity of some vegetables, we were still have them. We farm ourselves, we farm our rice. So when you control your value chain, you also control your I would say your history, your narrative, or how you also give uh, the services, and you're not dependent on on whatever can happen. Um, so I think really it's like when you build your model, try to be as self-sustainable as possible, uh, and even if we don't reach the 100%, but having the farm uh, has helped us a lot uh, to be able to double the number of patients that we had during the the strict lockdown when um, the pandemic happened because before that we were feeding 400 patients and we had to scale and double to 800 patients in only less than 13 days. So that adaptability was really made because first we had the industrial kitchen that we built in partnership with the Imbuto Foundation but second of all is that okay now we have a farm, we have the produce and we had to just hire people. It was a little bit difficult, but the idea of really try to control the value chain of your services as much as possible so that when something happens, you know how to fix them. You don't have to wait for somebody, I don't know, if we had a system or something, we don't have to wait for somebody that is in the US that at that moment can't help us. And also the other thing is that we have a tailored uh, web system that really help us to track our expenses, but also our patient. Um, so that really helped us a lot to be independent in that aspect. It's an incredible, you know, we are a live bank, we're supply chain people and, you know, delivering PPE, blood, oxygen in a pandemic where there's a shutdown is incredibly difficult. But you don't want to make it more difficult if you're not having, you're not controlling your own chain, you're not controlling all the inputs. Uh, you're completely right, Isabel, you know, making sure that you have some control, some level of control uh, on the inputs that you need to do your work and to drive impact is really, really critical. Uh, and I think, you know, health systems across Africa needs to start thinking about that. Like, what do we need? What, what parts of our value chain can be controlled within the country and that can be built you know, within the country, can, can be innovated by young people on the continent. So that's amazing, that's incredible. Lani, final words? Yeah, um, well, well, thank you. And um, I, I completely agree with, with, with both Isabel and what we are, particularly around the importance of uh, understanding the local context and adapting for the local context. Uh, but I think the pandemic has also shown how interconnected the world is, whether that's supply chain or just the fact that a virus was able to literally shut in a matter of weeks or, or months. Um, so just how, uh, you know, something that originates in one country can quickly impact all other countries. And so as far as what, how we can learn from this and really act on it, I think civil society will probably have, uh, this, this will probably have, has a much longer memory. Uh, and I think as organizations to really take the lessons that we've learned from this and incorporate those into, into the work that we're doing. Um, as far as policymakers and the government, um, I think, you know, hopefully uh, we, we learn more from this than previous pandemics um, as far as preparedness for, for the future as well. Uh, but I think looking right now, I think there is a window of opportunity. These next one to three years, this is very front of mind for literally everyone in the world. I don't think you can have a conversation with someone without COVID coming up. Um, and so for us as an organization, it was, how can we leverage that? You know, right now, school health isn't just an impactful way to improve children's health, it's existential to keep schools open. So that value proposition is higher than it, you know, perhaps ever has been before. Um, and so for us as an organization, it was how can we push ourselves to scale a bit faster now than we previously thought we would. We're, you know, we, we've about tripled in size in the past year. Um, so what we thought would previous, uh, what we thought would take two to three years to do. 
um, and then really doubling down and trying to get those policy changes in place while this still has the attention of those important makers and whether or not this is something that you can also get budgeted for as well. Um, so I think we do have like a one to three year window to really leverage um, the fact that we have the attention of those important decision makers. Um, they are looking at health, they're looking at how it impacts other sectors. Um, and uh, hopefully continue to, you know, this continues to be something that's front of mind well into the future. Um, but I think kind of really having a sense of urgency as well to try capitalize on the moment too, so that we're better prepared to avoid this in the future. And that, you know, 20 years from now, we can look back and say, yes, but the COVID-19 pandemic led to stronger, more resilient, more durable healthcare systems. Uh, so at least there's silver linings that come out of this otherwise terrible pandemic. Incredible. You know, I completely agree uh, that, you know, we have that window uh, and it's really important, like you were saying, you, you, you should put in, in size. Amazing, incredible, you know, world class. And, and for us too, at LifeBank, it was the same thing. You know, we, we were just doing, barely doing medical oxygen when the pandemic hit. And now we are, you know, such a huge, you know, oxygen as almost like, you know, squeezing blood out, you know, in terms of the sheer demand that is there. And in the work we're doing to build that resilient systems to make sure that, you know, should something else happen, there is a durability in our supply chain. Uh, I think it's really incredible. You know, I was telling somebody last week that I felt like I've built three new businesses within Live Bank in the last six months that I completely, you know, also still scaling blood, you know, scaling our normal business, but also still like, you know, making sure that we're building new things that will help uh, our continent respond to any other medical emergency, whether COVID or, or otherwise. Um, and I agree about that window of opportunity. So if you're an innovator, a future innovator that you're listening to this call, you're thinking, you know, should I start, you know, COVID? Mm -mm. This is your time, start. You know, if you have an innovation, if you have something you want to change, go ahead and change it. Because we have a window of opportunity, like Lonnie said, between one and three years to really get these conversations going and get change and drive change and be the change we want to see in our community. Uh, it's been incredibly amazing chatting with you guys. Lonnie, um, I love what you do. I love your experience. I love the, the way you're building and the way you're using data. Uh, well, we are, oh my God, you know, when you said that tap to pay, I just, I thought it, I was like, oh my God, we need that. We need that in healthcare. You know, we need that everywhere. Um, it's really amazing the work you're doing and, and making sure that you can reach people. I mean, 2 million meals during a pandemic. Incredible. Amazing incredible work. Isabel, I'm going to try that yoga. I promise, you know, I'm going to try for myself. I'm going to get my team to try yoga. You know, I love what you're saying about, you know, making sure that you, you, you're you controlling the inputs and, and probably, you know, employing people in your local community to make sure that those inputs are controlled and those inputs are coming in to build, you know, to create, you know, excellent nutrition for people who are ill. I, I, that's incredible. Um, Isabel, Wawira, Lonnie, you guys are fantastic. These are the people that, you know, I believe deeply that with your work, you know, we are going to build resilient health systems across Africa. And I am telling you guys on the call, uh, our listeners, please, 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 please go and innovate, get out there, get in the arena, do the work. You know, you, you've seen examples of people who are doing amazing things across the continent. And I am asking you, go out there, get in the arena, build change and be the change we need in Africa. Thank you, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed the panel um, and have a lovely afternoon.